I don't think that darkness is talked about enough. You know, there's always a family secret swept under the rug and forgotten about and, you know, only only brought up in hushed conversations. But I do think we're all better off if we bring those out in, into the light. Only recently have I been able to remember my dad as a, a good guy, which he was to see him as a, a three-dimensional person rather than just that dark side. And this, this goes to seeing the shadows. Uh, I saw for so long his shadow because of the way he left the world. And this comes from, uh, I recently got uh, uh, his journal and my mom sent it to me and it goes right up to a few days before he, he passed. And, and it's all very lighthearted and very, uh, very funny and, and loving, you know? Hello and welcome to The Ally Show. I'm Ali Islamifar and I'm your host for the show. We are in our episode number five, where we are chatting with my dear friend, Morgan Conduct. Morgan and I met about eight years ago, where we both used to live in San Luis Obispo at the time. Our friendship started around a very interesting, creative, poetic conversation. I'm not going to spoil it. Hopefully you will listen to it throughout the show. And... Because of that, I think it was a very special bond. And a few weeks ago when I asked Morgan to have this conversation, he had so many great ideas. We chatted for a couple of times, and I'm really excited for you all to listen to this conversation. In this episode, we are talking about the stories of someone's suicide, also some stories of addiction, if this is a sensitive topic to you, please skip this episode, and we hope that we see you in our future episodes. Also, if you or somebody that you know is suffering from any mental health issues, we highly encourage you to contact your mental health and or medical experts. Morgan's accountability campaign is about a three-week creative activity around embracing symbolism. Please stay tuned through the end of the episode to hear his amazing details around this campaign. Also refer to the show notes if you want to join him on this campaign. One last thing before we start this great conversation. If you want to support this podcast, the best way to support us is to follow us on both Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and you can rate us up to a five-star review. This would definitely help us to reach a broader audience who may benefit from this content. Now, without further ado, let's start our episode five with Morgan Conduct. I am interviewing and chatting here with a very old friend. Um, and this is interesting timing because it's also your birthday. Happy birthday, bud. That's right. Yeah. Thank you, man. Turned 40 on Thursday. Yeah. How was it? It was good. I had some friends from out of town from Chicago visiting who I haven't, I don't get to see very often. And it was just, and a few local friends, uh, we all gathered and had a, a very nice time. I'm very low key how I prefer it. And that's kind of how we did it. How does yeah. it feel like to be a 40? I, I know it's a it's a very classic question, but I want to know. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, I don't know. I'm definitely of the mind that uh, those numbers are insignificant. You know, like you, I know 60-year-olds who act younger than I do, and I know 30-year-olds who seem like they're 70. <laughs> I, I've seen enough of that to not put too much weight in those things, but um, but I, you can't avoid it. I mean, I'm a 40 year old man now. I remember my parents turning 40 as a kid and thinking like they are old. Uh, yeah. So that's really the one thought that kind of came to me is I guess I am old. I mean, of course, an older person would laugh at me, but I think in my, you know, reaching back to my young mind, I can confirm I am, a, I am an old guy. Just a little bit of a background for uh, our amazing listeners. I know Morgan back from San Luis Obispo. I used to work and live in San Luis Obispo for two years. 
um, at a company called Expert Exchange. That's where Morgan and I met for the first time. As we were on the pre-recording, Morgan said an interesting story that why don't you actually tell everyone how did we meet and how did we get to start chatting about like deep stuff? As a college kid, which I was then, at like a, in my early 30s, I, I had an untraditional trajectory in that regard. As a college man, I was uh, I was working at Experts Exchange doing uh, various things, mostly QA work. Like I had worked in video game testing, and that was sort of my next step. So I was doing that work, and um, if I'm being honest, my days were pretty dull there. Like I always looked forward to going to classes. <laughs> I, I liked the people a, a lot, and, and it was a good place to work for, and it really fit nicely with that time of my life, but you know, the job, my duties were very sort of uh, dry. So I'd look forward to anybody coming by to distract me. And pretty early on in your time there, you stopped by my desk and we just started like just random, randomly talking and the way you do when you're trying to avoid getting back to work. <laughs> and I'm an English major and I was really into poetry at the time and had really like been taking up a lot of my attention. So when you told me you were from Iran, I brought up Rumi, or maybe you did. And because uh, we had been talking about poetry and and you started talking about how great it, uh, Rumi is and Farsi and, and the original Farsi. And you, I don't remember if you read some off my computer or if you just recited some from memory, but you recited some Rumi in Farsi and I heard the musicality of it and it was I was like wow mind blowing because you know translated poetry can be clunky and then of course you're presented with a bunch of different translations and you're comparing them and trying to wondering what is closest to the original so to hear the original from you was a that was a very cool <laughs> very cool moment uh I and w w when you were sharing that story pre recording, I was like, yes, and now I know why we clicked so well back then. Because honestly, like Rumi has a big place in my heart, but I think just beyond that, poetry has always been something that even as a kid, I was like in my own personal time, I was like writing poetry and nobody knew about it actually maybe my mom is going to be shocked about it she's she actually knows a little bit of it but a lot of people don't know this because it was my one thing that i only had for myself and rumi has been a very interesting uh sort of like point of connection for me with a lot of good people in my life and i appreciate it so that that was a fun story you shared uh, i also want to uh share a little bit about how I felt about it because for me, I was at the time, I was a product designer and uh, of course, like just graduated from my master at ASU, but I really like missed that sort of like creative conversations and at a very dry tech company, you don't get much of it. But yeah. I, I think with you and a couple of other folks uh, during my time in San Luis Obispo, I was really able to kind of like get that creative uh, side of my mind happy. Uh, and I remember also like we were going out with friends, with a bunch of other uh, folks from the company or even outside of the company. What a great time, what a great city and uh, what a great place and uh, what great human beings there, to be honest. Like, is there is there anything from your experience in San Luis Obispo you want to share with the audience? I grew up in Pass Robles, which is 30 minutes sort of uh, north and inland from San Luis Obispo. And that was like the city for us, even though it's a fairly small town. Uh, but I only knew it in these like brief weekend visits growing up. So to work there and be immersed in it was like a real uh, kind of realized in one sense what I'd been missing. I think being able to go on a lunch break on a walk through the, the nature there up into the the hills over overlooking the ocean. It's, it's really uh, one of the most beautiful places on earth. Paso Robles is a funny place because it's sort of uh, it's divided into these two pretty different cultures. Uh, more so recently, it's got the wine industry with which, of course, attracts a lot of uh, high society yuppie types who come out to you know 
get hammered and go spend their money downtown. So you have this this funny dichotomy between them and the locals who many of whom are the farmers that grow the grapes or related in some way to the ag industry or just various other small town industries. Um, yeah, you got a lot of lower income, uh, you know, small town country folk like myself, uh, though I sort of am a, I can camouflage and move into that wine world now. I've learned, <laughs> I've learned how to do that. Anyway, I grew up in a peculiar situation out there. Uh, growing up, I grew up in a ghost town on the outskirts of Paso Robles. So I've only recently accepted that terminology, ghost town, but it was a uh, a plot of land with 13 homes on it, and only five or six of them were occupied, and sometimes fewer and sometimes more. Um, most of them are at various states of disrepair. And th this plot of land was owned by my grandpa. It was a real estate venture he took on in the 60s. Um, this is a lot of detail, but I think it's key to to my psyche, I'm realizing, is growing up in this place that was in decay and was an immense privilege to be in in a lot, a lot of respects. You know, it's this quiet, beautiful plot of land on the outskirts. And it's a free place to live. Our family didn't pay rent because um, it's, it's, you know, family owned. But there's this decay around us. There's like, and, and the homes were not in great shape. I grew up out there, um, and it, it was a beautiful early childhood. Like most of my childhood was pretty terrific. It got darker. There was a, a, a much darker stretch toward my teenage years, where addiction and mental illness and mental health issues were prevalent, not just in my immediate family, but in the houses around me, which were occupied only by family. So it was a very strange. Very strange upbringing. Um, yeah, so I, I grew up, you know, drawing. I spent, I, I was, I spent a lot of time on my own as a young kid. But um, my brother and I lived alone. When I was in sixth grade, we moved into a house on our own. So my brother, just a few years older than me, and myself were living next door to my parents, close enough that we were, we still felt kind of as a unit. But man, we had a lot a lot of freedom over there, and it became the place where our Friends would come. Everyone would want to go there because there's no parents in the house with us. And so, again, that's an immense privilege in some respects. We 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 did whatever the heck we wanted, and we had all this space to ourselves. It was like a Lost Boys clubhouse in a lot of ways, but uh, you know, it lacked the structure that the traditional, you know, three bedroom house or whatever would accommodate a kid. But yeah, it, growing up, I I, uh, I wasn't doing do, didn't do great in school. Um, in high school, things got really tough. I might be going into too much detail right here, but again, I, I, this is like at the core of me. The more I realize, the more I explore who I am, the more I realize this ghost town is sort of a uh, the single symbol I would point to to explain myself because it's a bunch of opposites. It's a bunch of uh, a, a lot of comfort and a lot of pain and a lot of conflict and a lot of peace. And, and, and this ghost town kind of, you know, embodies all of that. So I'll spare you all the, all the gritty details of, of living out there. Um, shortly after high school, I moved to Santa Cruz with a friend of mine, Enrique actually who worked at experts exchange with us. And I was there just for a couple of months. Um, before I, I learned that my father had committed suicide, which was the big event of my of my life, really, but certainly of my of my young adult life, that was the 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 shift. That was like a switch being flipped, where the fun and games and the levity and the lightheartedness and the free feeling of being out on my own and all that sort of were, was suddenly flipped on. You know, I, I hadn't, despite my the things I experienced growing up, I hadn't thought of the world as like a incredibly painful, difficult place. I haven't thought of existence as, as a trial. Uh, with that, introduced that idea, and uh, it's something I've I've dealt with since. So that happened. Uh, I remained in Santa Cruz, and and I had friends around who really you know supported me through that, and we 
managed to have a, a pretty great time. You know, like when I think back, there's a PTSD element that wipes your memory when these things happen uh, because you're so much of your subconscious is occupied with, uh, you know, coping and processing with this trauma that you're not recording what is happening around you. So it's a very blurry time in my life. Not long after that, I ended up in San Francisco, just stumbled into the tech industry, like literally walked into a door on a whim and because I saw some sign for interviews and ended up testing video games at Sega, you know, the Sonic the Hedgehog company. Tested video games for four years and uh, kind of climbed the ladder as much as I could in that. Worked at a couple companies, a couple startups. And then, uh, I mean, that's that was stage two of my 20s, which was even more magical than the first possibly. Just a, a full awakening. At that time, I had learned to cope more. I, I had really kind of develop some skills in coping, um, which allowed me to live more presently and actively and be involved in the city and life up there and develop friend groups and things like that. And uh, that was wonderful. Uh, quite a lot happened since then. <laughs> I moved two years ago to Richmond, Virginia. Um, between San Francisco and today, I got my English degree, focusing a lot on poetry with the intent of teaching and have worked in support roles in education for the past few years. Uh, uh, I tried my hand at traditional teaching and I don't have the the hurting skills. The, the uh, I, I'm not a great controller of the chaos of the classroom. I, I just don't have that. I don't have that intense presence that's required to, to do that. So I, I, I done a lot of kind of tutoring and I substitute taught for a while. Um, in English though, I like talking with students about reading and writing and, and that's sort of what I've done these past few years. Um, I have a couple of, um, reactions and also like follow up questions. I think it's, it's interesting to start how, you keep going back to the ghost town. I think um, that kind of like resonates with me the way I also like think about parts of my childhood and also like my hometown as kind of like a place that carries a lot of like those traumas. It, it became a spot that I can point to stories to. It's like things that happened there, things that happened in the ghost town. Um, I think for for you as a creative person, I, w I would wonder how you picture that uh, ghost town in your drawings. Because I've seen a lot of, you, you know, I'm a big fan of your drawings. I've seen a lot of like very interesting okay. things in your drawing. Um, that That's, that's kind of like one area that I have some reactions, but also questions, follow-up questions. Two, I think the story with uh, about uh, losing your uh, father, I think... At the same time that it's very painful and I relate to it personally, but also like just hearing uh, uh, one of your parents committing suicide. I, I, I'm curious what you went through your head around that experience. And of course, like how you coped also, I yeah. think is very interesting. Like as a creative person, that numbness, you turn that numbness to something a lot more meaningful. So yeah. like there are three or four areas where are you want to start? Yeah. Yeah, I'll start with the first thing you mentioned, the uh, creativity in the ghost town and, and sort of being shaped by that experience. Uh, so I, my artwork has been criticized by mostly by my mother as being too dark, too dark. And when I was younger, violent and kind of angsty, <laughs> you know, I grew up into like heavy metal and punk and stuff like that and really that stuff resonated with me because I it allowed me to play with the ugliness that was around me it was it's a I mean I think for a lot of people that punk and metal music and horror films you see a lot of a lot of kids with kind of troubled upbringings are into horror and I think it's because there's a it's a, a playfulness it's the same elements it's fear and it's anger and it's sadness but it's 
you, that element of play is brought in. And that's what drawing for me was. I was toying with the scary imagery. I love the monsters. And, you know, as I grew up, I, the monsters became symbolic of things. Like I would have a sarcasm monster that, you know, as me expressing my frustration with a lack of, uh, a lack of frankness and in, in conversation with people. And one of the scenes or, or, or motifs of my childhood there that can't be avoided when talking about this stuff is my, I had two uncles who lived there who I was very close to, or one of whom I was very close to, uh, as a kid and they became, they got into drugs, like heavy drugs, like amphetamines and things like that and became more distant. But we wanted, you know, we lived in the same town. So we saw these guys become these guys who I connected with, uh, you know, their families fall apart and then lose contact with their children. And, and one of my uncles, uh, developed like schizophrenia or rather that manifested from his drug use or maybe it's it's always unclear what came first you know there was this interplay between his schizophrenia and his intense drug use and he was a neighbor and he would you know scream in his house at night and have these like really intense mental health crises that i would fall asleep i would be falling asleep hearing them hearing him howling about various things and that that was one of those things where i was like only recent, only recently have I realized, like, oh, that's that may have been a trauma, like that, you know, because I always looked at the one event in my life, my father's suit. There's my trauma. I have the trauma, and then I realized, like, oh, other people have helped point this out to me. Like, wow, man, that's a bit intense. So that sort of stuff was going on, and many, I mean, there are many, many incidences I can point to of violence and and you know uh, despair that I witnessed outside of my immediate family and within. And uh, yeah, I always, uh, creativity, thank, thank God, uh, came to me, or I came to it maybe, <laughs> and uh, I used it. Like sometimes obsessively and sometimes I forgot about it. I should also mention, this is an interesting fact, that both of these, um, both of these uncles were incredible artists, better than I'll ever be, I, I suspect. <laughs> I have their paintings on my walls and, and they, I admired them so much as a kid. And it's such an odd thing to have maybe inherited that from them or seen that practice in their lives and, and loved it and clung to it. And in fact, maybe a relevant story is, is uh, my uncle who was a schizophrenic for a good decade of my life. He was, just somebody I would see, like a shadow. You'd see move into his house, and he'd sneak out and walk into town, and and you'd see a light on at night, and you'd hear him yelling in there, and and occasionally there would be some sort of drama with him and another family member. But he was this kind of scary figure for myself and and my friends. You know, that's another component of this: is the whole town, a small town, the whole town knows this guy. He walks around town and you'll see him ranting in the street, you know, and people knew, oh, that's, that's one of Morgan's uh, relatives. <laughs> so it became tied to me in this way. And he became this intimidating, scary figure, uh, this symbol of like what I might become as a convict to myself. Um, certainly it scared me away from drug use. <laughs> Eventually in my early twenties, I, I came back to our town. I think I was living in Santa Cruz at the time and, I decided I didn't want him to be this boogeyman and I'm just going to go talk to him and see how he responds to that because I loved his artwork and I hadn't seen it in years. It was all holed up in this house with him, you know? So I walk over there and I just knock on the door and he answers and he's, he's startled to see anybody, you know? And he, and I say, Hey, I'm interested in seeing your artwork. I remember really loving it as a kid and he lit up. And was perfectly coherent and brought me in and showed me his paintings and explained them in a not so coherent way. But he 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 walked me through his years of artwork and he he hadn't created any artwork in a long time. But that one that one little moment turned him from you know rehumanized him and 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 took the power this like 
traumatic power of his away and made him a human again. From that point on, I could see him and say, hi, how are you doing? I'd run into him in town and instead of hiding from him and pretending he's not, you know, I don't nothing, I don't know who this guy is. I'd go up and say, how are you doing? You need a ride home, you know? He he was, yeah, I got to see him as a, a decent, very troubled person who in many ways was just a symbol uh, of our our culture's failure addressing mental health. Yeah, so that 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 stuff informs my creativity still. I, I think it always always will have a darkness and a, a, a creepiness and a uh, a weirdness to it, which is just a, you know in my bones. <laughs> and I resonate with that a lot. I think we talked about it even in the past few times. Um, for me, I totally get this because um, there is always like this shadow in our lives and life is not always like good music there's also like sometimes harsh music and it's that combination and that balance between realizing the dark sides and the shadows of course realizing those and knowing where we are now and having an appreciation for what we have not to be too positive but actually understanding what what happened in the past and what's the reality today so until we don't see and until we don't meet our shadows i don't think we have a path to understanding ourselves and that's why i always like connect so much with um people who understand that darkness very well and appreciate yeah. it in a creative way that's why i like I personally like techno music does the same thing as yeah. like trash metal probably uh, did to you and really accepting that shadow meeting that shadow and really feeling comfortable with it and that's that's where your self awareness just starts I find it hard to find a fine line between uh, the the dark side and the bright side, which is like yeah. what we are trying to build. Finding that fine line to me is life. Yeah. Finding a balance between meeting your shadow and being okay with it and taking the next steps, but knowing that there is a fine line to always go to that dark side. That awareness, I think, is something unique. Yeah, very, very well said. I want to say real quick that that makes me think of, in some way, how grateful I was to have. Uh, you know, a varied experience. I, I'm not. I'm not thankful that my that my family members were were suffering in these ways. But um, I am thankful that that suffering could have some positive reverberating effects. You know, in the long term, it it manifested in I think something very useful, which is exactly that. I became, and I think a lot of children of addicts or people with that addiction in their family. Are, they are given this opportunity to see this would this might be what happens to me if I'm a this looks a lot like how I might look if I get involved in the family we all show each other our flaws and our strengths in ways that yeah it gives us access to our our darkness and our lightness I, I don't think that darkness is talked about enough you know there's always a family secret swept under the rug and forgotten about and you know only only brought up in hushed conversations, but I do think we're all better off if we bring those out in, into the light. You mentioned the story about uh, losing your father. Mm -hmm. uh, however much you want to go into the details, I'm kind of like curious personally because I, yeah. I lost my father like... Uh, right before actually joining Expert Exchange, like right a year before that. And yeah. I, I know some of what what happens when you lose a parent. I think there's, there's some sort of a trauma, as you called out, the trauma of like the suicide. I, I'm curious to know a little bit more about that and what went through your mind and the numbness after it was also like something interesting I want to dive in. Yeah. I mean, a lot of this pain you, you're very familiar with, uh, uh, and I know you've had other guests speak about losing friends and family members. So I guess I'll speak specifically to maybe 
the suicide component of that, which is special uh, to use a maybe a strange word for that, but it's it's unique in that it uh, it feels like a betrayal. You know, there's this when somebody you love commits suicide, there's a sense that well, there's a very you know immediate like what the hell like why didn't they say anything did i even know them there's a, a lot of this uh and then there's of course like how dare they inflict this pain on the family how dare they like and that and it's a pain that had very material it could be measured very directly it it created further addiction and trauma and caused harm like a really uh really apparent harm so yeah i think that's something that only recently have i been able to remember my dad as a, a good guy which he was you know like to see him as a, a three-dimensional person rather than just that dark side and this this goes to seeing the shadows <laughs> like you mentioned it's uh, I saw for so long his shadow because of the way he left the world. And this comes from, uh, I recently got uh, his journal. Or like a, He was doing typing practice on our, on our home computer. And this was in the early 2000s, around, around 2004. He was doing this daily journal in order to practice typing. And my mom sent it to me. And it goes right up to a few days before he, he passed. And... And it's all very lighthearted and very, um, very funny and and loving, you know. And it's a tragedy that that suicide uh, hi hides this loving dimension of people. And, you know, there's so much more to his, his story. He had suffered from depression and had been on antidepressants. And he was also a, a, an alcoholic, an addict of some sort. I, I, I don't know, you know, the details. I don't know fully, but he was an alcoholic at the very least. And uh, so there, there's these different components that really, in a lot of ways, are are outside of him. I mean, he, he missed a, a refill on his his antidepressant medication the day before he died. And, and so there was this, our family was actually part of a class action lawsuit. I, I do think he would probably still be here if it weren't for that. But there are so many other factors. I mean, the depression itself, um, his physical body was failing him. He was having real, he was out of work due to se uh, severe pain, uh, back issues and things. Uh, I don't know. Being able to see in hindsight the complexity of him as a person and the complexity of his death and his life, uh, that's that's been the most useful when it comes to to moving on and coping and, 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 and being happy. It's not seeing him or his death as any one thing, but this massive mixture. <laughs> I think you very beautifully started this part by saying that you've been able to see him more as a 3D, three dimension. Mm -hmm. And I think as you were just like going on and going on, I could see the dimensions. Like, you know, it's like you hear, and I, I, I really want to express this. You hear someone did this or someone committed suicide or someone is depressed like any uh, any of the mental health um stories that we talk about you hear one thing and that's the outside story we are seeing but i think inside like it's it's really important to also like see the story from inside like a more empathetic view and also like in your story like for example missing uh missing a prescription uh by mm -hmm. a day or two 
And I think when you see that from inside, things start like becoming a lot more easier not to accept, but to be pictured. And I think like when when we are able to picture stories like this, it's just allowing us to cope better with them because we also start understanding that we have that 3D view in ourselves. Then we start like paying more attention to that part. In your case, and sometimes in my case, it comes as a creative outcome, like because we pay attention to that 3Dness. It's not just always like external. There's also like inside that we have to pay attention to in ourselves. So I think that's that was beautifully said, and like I think you very nicely kind of like walked us through that experience. Thank you very much for that. I also want to say like in my experience, one thing that recently helped is to also like admit that in my experience with my father, like that was also like multi-dimension. It wasn't like always like, because for a very long time, I was like missing my father because, oh yeah, like he was this good man. He had all these good impacts in my life. But frankly, as I'm going through therapy and so many other things, not not that it was his fault, but he was also like the reason of a lot of like my traumas in my life. And I think yeah. like realizing multi-dimensional uh, impacts that f- family members, parents, they can have in our lives, not to hold them accountable for it. It's, it's just life. But realizing those aspects it is also like really helps you to finally figure out i was i was not able to cope in the past 9 years now i'm actually finally able to cope with losing him after 9 years yeah. because i was able to figure out the multidimensional aspect of my relationship with him when i think of like coping with it, with moving on with life after that incident uh, after that I didn't go to therapy until, you know, uh, well over, I think, 10 years after that happened. Well over 10 years. And I only went very briefly. I I didn't find it super helpful because I I think I I didn't take the time to find the right therapist for me. It it, it was useful, but only only for a short time. I I ended up stop. I I stopped going. I highly encourage therapy. I've seen it work magic on everybody. any, pretty much everybody I know that's done it has has benefited tremendously. But I I was doing my own things, and a lot of it had to do with just like living it with <laughs> with that combined light and darkness in my mind, and and like wrestling with grief, like l- really writing about it and and talking about it. Um, I met my wife right after my my dad died actually we'd known each other we've been sort of in the same friend group but she had experienced immense uh grief prior to meeting me she had lost her mother at 11 at 11 years old to to cancer and um had been engaged to a a friend of mine uh, uh, and he died from um he had marrow cancer uh leukemia and she'd lost him. And, and so she had just gone through so much. And we were talking. We, we were we were we were talking. We were already connecting. And then that happened with my my father, right as our relationship was sort of taking off. So I mean, having her there was like it was somebody to show me the ropes, you know? Like I really uh, I lucked out. And in some ways <laughs> I had it easier than a lot of people do. I had a partner who had been through it really, really intensely to talk with. And yeah, and uh, I think that's that's that that was huge for me is talking with her and talking with friends. I'm thankful to have friends who, you know, a lot of people you meet kind of shut down when when serious stuff is brought up and they they don't want to go there. That's too heavy for them or this is getting weird. And I, I, I've got some friends who are really great. Not only will they humor me when I'm, when my, uh, my, just dis- my conversation veers into the dark, but they'll actually, you know, check in on me and bring stuff up and ask me about it. And, uh, so that's, that's been huge is keeping that stuff from getting too dusty and letting it 
fester in my subconscious and turn into whatever negative behavior it might turn into. And I did struggle. I, we had a time a few years um, shortly after I was working at Experts Exchange. My wife's father died in a fairly traumatic situation when my father-in-law her in a, a house fire and that was that pushed us to our brink because we had both been there and kind of nurtured each other out of grief and helped each other along and then that happened and we kind of weren't taking very good care of ourselves at the time you know we were going out and drinking with friends and self-medicating in certain ways and just not being very good to our bodies, not exercising. And this would, I, looking back, I would call these like the dark days of my life, which to be honest, weren't, uh, you know, this was no like requiem for a dream or train spotting situation. It was just a, a dark time. And, and this was a, a big blow to us, but we're focusing on how we got, how I got out of this stuff. And, and, and again, this situation, we transcended it by holding each other accountable and recognizing when one of us was going too far into our heads, retreating, I think we both have the tendency to do that. I certainly do. I, I think suffering for me looks like cutting, be, go, like going dark to my family. I, I, I no longer talking a lot. So I'm I'm kind of like curious as far as like your coping mechanism. You talked about a few things. You moved uh, you moved around from Santa Cruz back to Paso and San Luis Obispo area, and then even now you're you moved away from West Coast now in Richmond. It's been it feels like you've been on a journey. Kind of like want to understand how's your coping mechanism. Uh, been throughout this process and things you've used to kind of like get yourself into a mental health state that you love to have. I'm in Richmond, Virginia now. Uh, I've been here for two years and that was a huge shakeup in my life. I've only ever lived in California. So and we kind of picked this place at random. Like ne we never visited Richmond before we moved here. <laughs> we passed through Virginia before and Thought it was a beautiful place that we would consider living in, but really moving out here was sort of one of those like late pandemic, like screw this, let's go try something new moves, you know. Anyway, yeah, that that's been a huge, uh, wonderfully positive change. Honestly, we were in something of, of a dark patch before moving out here. A lot of that just had to do with where the world was. You know, uh, 2021, just like sort of in that waning end of the pandemic and we were in a dark space and coming out, suddenly being surrounded. Like I can go in any direction and everything is brand new to me. Hugely stimulating, uh, hugely inspiring. And even still, I mean, two years in, I'm like, I could drive now it's 15 minutes in any direction and find something new with a bunch of history and meet new people. So that's been, and I highly recommend it. Anybody who's thinking of picking up and, and relocating, go somewhere that you know very little about. You know, do some research to make sure it resonates with you. It, it, your interests will be fed in that area. But man, is it a revitalizing experience. But going back to my, my coping mechanisms, um, one of my most valued coping mechanisms is is reading and writing and i've always read novels and, and, and short stories i loved those growing up but going back to school um in my early 30s going to college introduced me to poetry i had a couple professors who are incredibly well versed in poetry and very patiently presented it to our classes and and we had conversations around you know classic poems and it's something that was a real revelation to me even though of course I'd been exposed to poetry and liked writing it and everything growing up but as an adult who had been taking in narratives you know just just 
stories that have a beginning and an end and are designed and have lessons and uh, to suddenly find these small morsels, a single page that is packed with meaning that relies as much on the reader as it does the author, you know, uh, it was huge for me. Um, so I went at Cal Poly, I ended up taking a bunch of poetry classes and getting really involved in it. Uh, I, I entered contests. I won, I won the Academy of American Poets contest, which, which was a big moment for me. <laughs> and, and my poems were always kind of goofy. Like I, I guess sort of like my drawings, I brought some silliness and some darkness uh, into it. Like one of my, one of the poems I won a contest for was about going into a sunglass hut that doesn't have a bathroom and the, and the sunglass hut, you look outside and it's, it's taken off from earth and it's, flo it's floating up toward the sun. And now you're trapped in this sunglass hut without a bathroom and you're moving closer to the sun. Very, very stupid and not deserving of any sort of award, but I managed. I think there was just enough irony in there. Uh, anyway. Good uh, PR. Good or, any good or bad PR for a sunglass <laughs> hut, I guess they take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're back on the map because of me. <laughs> um, but yeah, poetry, it, it, uh, it, I mean, can, can I read you a short, very short poem that expresses Yes. It? Please, I, I was actually just gonna ask. I, I had suspected this would come up, and and there was there's a Emily Dickinson poem called "I Dwell in Possibility," that is specifically about why poetry is is so great and more freeing than the narrative literature, prose. So here's the poem: "I Dwell in Possibility." I dwell in possibility, a fairer house than prose more numerous of windows, superior for doors, of chambers as the cedars, impregnable of eye, and for an everlasting roof, the gambrels of the sky, of visitors the fairest, for occupation this, the spreading wide my narrow hands to gather paradise. So it's a, it's a dense poem, Emily Dickinson. She packs a lot into very little. And uh, that was beautiful. And one of the lines I love in that is the of chambers as the cedars, impregnable of eye. And for an everlasting roof, the gambrels of the sky. This idea that this house of 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 poetry, she calls it I dwell in possibility. She's talking about poetry compared to pro a finer house or fairer house than prose. And she's saying these rooms are impregnable like the chambers of cedars you ever seen inside like a cedar bush how it's just complex web of branches and and you know i think there's berries in there just a a mess you know uh that you can't you can't pierce with your gaze and that's what i love about poetry is is there's no solving it you can read a novel i mean a lot of novels you can read and feel like you've really gotten everything out of it. But a little discussion of the metaphors and, you know, some con reading about context and things like that. Poetry to me, I suppose it reflects my own life. Like my own life is one that is not a traditional trajectory. Here I am at 40 years old and I, I'm i still on the periphery of a real career. <laughs> I'm in a support role. I have support roles. And I have been for a while, you know, I've dabbled in real career uh, trajectories, these paths, and I can't quite settle on one. I, I, and in so many other ways, my life is not on the typical course of a life. The, you know, I know you're a fan of Joseph Campbell, Ollie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I am too. I love him. And I think it's incredibly useful to think of narrative structure in relation to our lives and to look at the way in which these narratives, the hero's journey, they're, they're so similar across all cultures and times. Like we think of ourselves as the heroes in our stories, going out into the world, overcoming obstacles. You know, we have a mentor and we, we conquer the beast 
and we return to our known world with our lesson, our elixir, or whatever, however that's symbolically represented. And I think that there's a heck of a lot of truth to that. You can apply that on anybody's life and sort of form their life into that narrative and tell that story that way. But so often, especially in the short term, our lives don't fit that. I think we are, are everyone is the hero in their story, but they're often also the villain and they're everything else. They're, they're the whole spectrum of characters. And mentors aren't exactly mentors always. I, I mean, there is no, the neatness of a, a narrative arc does not apply to our lives in a lot of ways. And I think so much of uh, like social media kind of amplifies this need to narrativize your life, to build a story of yourself, to build a consistent brand. And poetry helped me come to terms with the fact that I am inconsistent. I'm a bundle of contradictions and poetry in, in all its forms has been hugely beneficial to me. The poem that you read for us, by the way, reminded me of like some of the poems that we have a very famous Iranian Persian uh, poet, Sorab Seperi, for my uh, Farsi listeners, for my Iranian listeners, they, they know about him very well, that he also does the same thing. There's like so, so much packed visualization back to back and it's up to you where you want to take the story that you're listening to and i think what what you just read reminded me of that and gave me this hint of how much a poem can dimensionalize how we are thinking about life with yeah. some simple word you can be taken to this 3d uh VR experience in a way that like you you can just use those words to define your word the way you want it yeah. and I think that's so powerful as a as a tool to have in our toolkit following that I I was reminded of another conversation we had about me going to Burning Man like before going to Burning Man I called you and we had a very good deep conversation you called out something very important there that really helped me throughout my experience there, which helped me to be so much more present. A lot of time, to your point, like social media or just like the new way of living is putting a lot of pressure on us to like have this perfect life and to always have a story for something, to always record something, to always be productive. But sometimes, honestly, we just have to drop it. We just have to accept the moments as they are throughout my Burning Man experience, our conversation, because you told me like, just try to like, also like see and observe and don't think that much about creation while you're there. And it was super helpful. Your advice, I, I remembered our conversation, I can tell you over 20 times while I was there because it just became a really good reminder for me that you're not here to create, you're here to absorb, you're here to understand, you're here to just get lost. My, my uncle was the painter with schizophrenia. He has these incredibly elaborate ink drawings that are pointillistic and, and you can go in at a square inch and find a bunch of stuff going on. He said, don't get lost in ink. He said, be careful because when you're crouched into the paper with this tiny point zero zero five pen and doing this little detail, like you lose so much like yeah, it's too small of a space to exist within, and yeah, like going to going going to Burning Man or any a concert or these experiences, like putting your phone away and enjoying the little bits of it, the smells and the and, and poetry. I mean, the main reason I love poetry is because selfishly, it just I live more aware. Like well, when I'm, especially when I'm writing poetry, when I'm thinking of which I haven't done it much of in these last couple of years, but I've done a little. And my brain is in this observational state of like taking things in. I'm just noticing more and I'm picking up little bits and patterns and motifs. And I'll, I'll make the segue into bird watching, which is sort of a natural sister activity of poetry. I, uh, almost any poet whose book you, you pick up is going to have some mention of birds in there and some, some more than others. But uh, my wife and I, like a lot of uh, 
you know, 30, 40 year olds got pulled into bird watching a couple of years before the pandemic. And through the pandemic, it was a huge help setting out a bird feeder and acknowledging, you know, identifying the species that are coming to your feeder and writing them down and things like that. But more importantly, going out into the world and hiking and suddenly having these new symbols, like a, which, a, which a bird can become a powerful symbol. Of course, you want to see it as the animal it is. And that's the goal of bird watching is to see it for what it really is, if that's possible. But by doing so, you, you're inviting new symbols into your life. And I mean, we have countless stories of a specific birds that show up at weird times. And sometimes it's in an ugly parking lot and you see an owl species you've never seen before standing on this crappy broken tree above you. Like it can be in this really unexpected areas. And one example is a road runner, uh, which is a, a bird I had seen once in my life. And it was coming home from the beach and waking up. The Californians know this experience well as a kid. You go to the beach and you wear yourself out playing in the waves. And you wear yourself out and, and you come home in this like coma of a sleep in the back seat. And when you get to your house, oh, we woke, I woke up to my parents being like, whoa, Roadrunner, right in front of our house. And we pulled up and you see a Roadrunner, which is a large, a fairly tall bird. I don't know, a good foot and a half tall. And they're, you know, they run on their feet. And they look peculiar and they have these crazy eyes. And I just remember it left a big impression on me. And it ran off and we were like, wow, Roadrunner. And I knew by my parents' reaction that that was a special bird. I never saw one again until 25 years later, uh, 30 years later, uh, 25 years later. Uh, my wife and I are out looking for birds. And I start telling her about this road run the Roadrunner story. I tell that exact story to her. And we turn around, we're walking back to the car, and our roadrunner's in the road. And it's the second roadrunner I've ever seen. I haven't seen one since. And, you know, poetry brought me there indirectly, but it put me in this space of noticing uh, details and inviting symbolism and synchronicities into my life. And uh, I'd say the magic of that has been the single most, like, powerful you know, positive force mentally, in terms of mental health for me. Is there any open conversation from like anything that we talked about that you want to close before I go to my final closing questions? I just want to reiterate the importance of disconnecting from the idea of, of expectation or yeah. over expectation. I, I I don't think it's good for us to be constantly looking for something to happen and, and bringing things into fruition. And I, I do believe in this the idea of manifesting, which has become very popular. The mm -hmm. idea of thinking something into reality. I do think there's a lot of truth to that and power to that practice. But on the other hand, uh, I've I've prayed and and beat my head into a wall at times thinking, uh, wishing upon something to happen and, and doing what I can to bring it about and it doesn't happen. And I think we need to be aware of that as a possibility and not be destroyed when that doesn't happen and not let that failure, though it's not a failure, I would argue, not let that disappointment define us I think it's important to to just keep a broad perspective of things and be aware of the contradictions in ourselves and in the world around us. Invite complexity, invite weirdness. Um, yeah, and, and play around a bit. <laughs> Man, this this resonates a lot, and I'm I'm recalling the advice you gave me before going to Burning Man. Yeah. Um, it really helped me to have zero expectation. It calmed mm -hmm. me down. It also helped me to have zero expectation and great things happen. Like, I think that there's also like very 
interesting thing about what you said about like not having that much expectation or not having any expectation because when you don't expect something, when you avoid too much planning, then you have that capability to flow and to maneuver back to a surfing conversation we had. I got a really great advice as I surfed for the first time in my life. I got a really good advice from this teacher that was, yes, your body is ready and good, but you're stiff. Try to maneuver. Try to play with the waves instead of trying to resist it, instead of trying to understand it. You don't have to understand it. Just maneuver. Just go wherever it takes you. And when I took that advice, I could easily jump on the wave and go. And I think life can become like that if we avoid having expectations and too many of these planning, some of it might be good. I don't know, like example by example, it's different context by context. It is different. But having that capability to see things and experience things without expectation and maneuvering through it, Mm -hmm. I think that's what makes life more interesting and more real. And yeah. That's why I love that advice you gave me, and I keep going back to it, to be honest. So yeah, thank you. What, what better teacher of that lesson is there than grief? I mean, when you lose somebody and they're no longer in existence with you, you're kind of given a sporking path. And one way is to fight against it and to rage against it and to numb yourself. And, and, and another is to follow, like, feel the feelings and move with it and adapt and and let it change you completely which i think is ultimately what grief does is it's it's just changes you into something completely different and if you're trying to stay the person you were before all that happened then you're going to be it's going to be a torture fest <laughs> That, that resistance, you're right. I think I think a lot of time we get stuck because we want to be stuck. We want to be stuck in the past. We yeah. get stuck because we are like, oh no, I, I don't want I don't want my current situation to change. but no, it, you have to accept that. Yeah. I don't know like th- does that resonate with you? Big time. Yeah, I, I, I disconnected from uh, who I thought I should be and I just let who I was guide the way you know and that I I can point to a lot of specific decisions going back to college was one of those where I was like I'm 30 I missed the boat I'm done like college nobody in my family goes to college I don't want to be the old guy in class this and that but that was one of those things where I was like screw it I want to do this and I think it will you know It'll benefit me greatly. I'm interested in this stuff. And uh, here I am not working in some impressive role with my English degree. I'm not a, you know, an author uh, or anything like that, not making a bunch of money. But man, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for the world. I, uh, I, I set aside the expectation of becoming the next R.L. Stein. As we always ask uh, from all of our friends and guests who show up on the show, um, I'm, I'm kind of curious if there are any activities that you would like to do or you would like to recommend to our audience to do for a month, uh, yeah. to do it with you, to, to do it with themselves, so that it's something that helps them with their mental health as an activity that you would recommend. Sure, yeah. I, I, I've listened to your 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 past episodes, I, I saw this coming, maybe over-prepared for it. So I'll keep it very simple. I came up with maybe a three-week challenge and, and go with the flow, do it however you want. But three things that I think are very helpful in accessing this headspace that I'm always trying to access, often failing, by the way. I think an important part of this challenge and everything else is knowing that you're probably going to be failing more than you succeeding. 
and be okay with that. Three week challenge. One week, engage in some sort of divination practice. And that's a that's sort of where you do some sort of ritual to invite symbolism into your life. And I think the best one, the ones that people are most familiar with are like the tarot cards or the I Ching, the Chinese I Ching, which both of those you can look up online. You can even do it online if you want. Uh, look up the rules. They can be done very quickly or you can build your whole life around them. I mean, these are incredibly deep, complex rituals and practices. Do a divination ritual of your own design. Use some structure like the I Ching or the tarot or whatever you want. You can freestyle it. Well, that's week one. Week two, um, similarly, you want, is focused around inviting spontaneity and, and symbolism into your life um, through observing nature with some intent. So going out on your daily walk, maybe bring a notebook and write down any little peculiar things you see. The other day I took a picture of a, in the alley near my house in someone's yard, they had a wheelbarrow with a small wheelbarrow inside of it. That would be a perfect example of something you might. Uh, you could do this through bird watching as well. Sit down, maybe set up a bird feeder or just go to where a creek or a pond is, some area that might have a high bird activity. And there are great apps out there for identifying birds and identifying plants and insects. Bring those into it. There's one called Seek for plants and insects, and there's one called Merlin. And uh, it, that allows you to enter in the details of a bird you saw, and it'll tell you the species. Week three is writing a poem. And I think if you want to write, I don't think about writing a poem that's good or like that anybody else has to read. Just write a poem that that comes to mind and maybe use those previous two weeks, the symbols and ideas you've brought into your life to inform it. Again, the internet's a good a good starting point for this. You can look up poetic forms and use this established poetic form, a sonnet or a villanelle or a terza rima or whatever, and and go that route, have a kind of some bones to, to start with, or go completely free and, and don't worry about rhyme. Don't worry about anything, and 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 just condense some big ideas into some small, small sentences, <laughs> small stanzas. That is amazing. I am going to try this. Uh, I I kind of feel like I am doing this sometimes, but like I love that you gave us a structure here. Like first, try to like familiarize yourself with like some sort of. Uh, symbolism in general, things that exist, and then go out and like try to see it outside and you generate your own in a way in your head yeah. and also bring it to your paper when you get home. And then third, try to actually give it a meaning, try to give it life by creating yeah. Yeah. something out of this process. This is such a such a solid creative process you're introducing yeah. to us and I, I want us to important. practice with you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think it's important to note that the uh, I don't I'm not like a, a cultist, a, a magic guy. I don't believe I don't believe I don't think in the whatever the forces behind ten. Well, I don't have any belief here that in fact, I'm mostly free of all belief. But that doesn't I these are in fact, one of one of the points of this ritual is to let these powers into your life. I mean, again, this is a contradiction. Invite a power in and let it do its work, despite maybe being a rational modern person who believes in science or whatever, you know. We let those contradictions play here and don't feel uh, obligated yeah. to be on any one side. Thank you so much for bringing this much preparation into the show. I, I really appreciate it. And this means a lot. This was a great conversation. I, I'm i going to miss it. So who knows? Maybe we come back. Um, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm excited, honestly, like uh, for what you have ahead of you. And I'm excited to continue staying in touch with you and just keep learning from you. 
I, I wanted, I, I think I told you a couple of times, I really wanted to make this uh, conversation in person. I was just bummed that I couldn't make it like to so many other travels that I have, but I'm hoping that we can meet in person sometime soon. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. I, your, your perspective is uh, incredibly valuable to me and always has been. So it's cool Same to here. be able to, to mingle, mingle our minds. Yeah. <laughs> always, always. Thank you so much again and have a wonderful day. You too. Thanks, Ali. That was our conversation with Morgan Conduct. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to join his accountability campaign for three weeks of creative activities around symbolism, you can use the link on the show notes and sign up to join to his campaign. This show is completely nonprofit, so please remember that the best way to support us is to go to Spotify and or Apple Podcasts, and you may rate us up to a five-star review. This would help us to be seen by those who may benefit from this content. Thanks again, and see you on the next episode of The Ally Show.